Welcome everyone. My name is Carmen Yetzi Mazera. I serve as Executive Director of APSIA, the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs, to which all of your institutions belong. I'm very glad to welcome you to another one of our career webinars exploring the many different things that are possible with a degree in international affairs. Today we're joined by Kath Thompson, who's the Program Director at the Peace and Security Funders Group, and we're going to have the chance to explore what is, what is meant by peace and security philanthropy, and then the many different opportunities that are possible therein. I do invite you as we go through the conversation or now, if there was something you really wanted to learn, something that, that drove you to register and attend a webinar on peace and security philanthropy, please be sure you put that in the chat and we will do our best to cover as much ground as we can with the time that we have. To begin though, Kath, I invite you to just tell us a little bit about your background and, and how you came to find yourself at a place like PSFG. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Carmen. Um, it's good to see everybody virtually. Um, and I love that you do these um, sessions. I wish I had had this before I decided to go to grad school and decided my, my career path. Um, but I, I, I guess I can trace the career I have now way back to the fact that I'm a third culture kid. So um, I'm American, but I grew up in my early formative years in the Philippines um, because my parents were working there um, and sort of grew up with a sense of the world being bigger than um, my passport, what my passport was. Um, but then when, when we came back to the United States, we settled in Wisconsin, which is where my parents are from, which is very rural and very small, small town. Um, so I guess I always maintained this fascination with um, the exchange of cultures and the exchange of ideas. Um, I attended undergrad at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, um, studied international relations, uh, political science, peace and conflict resolution studies um, with a minor in African studies. Um, and that experience, um, as some of you who have studied abroad, um, can can testify that that is formative, um, combining my love of research and academics with um, being able to travel elsewhere and see the world bigger than what it was in Wisconsin. Um, as I was wrapping up my undergrad, um, I was trying to figure out what to do, and it was the height of the Great Recession, um, so jobs were quite scarce. So I just applied to as many fellowships as I could. Um, upon the recommendation of one of my advisors, um, I decided to apply for a Fulbright um, because I spoke some Arabic and French and I had been um, to Morocco and I was, uh, had done some undergraduate research on trend, um, transitional justice. Um, so I applied to do a research project on Morocco's Equity and Reconciliation Commission, um, which was accepted. So after my undergrad, I went to Morocco, um, studied Arabic for a while, and, and, and met some amazing people, some folks who um, had been real champions of human rights there in Morocco and, and learning from them. Um, and, but as that was wrapping up, I was then again looking for the next thing, um, because if you live on fellowships, you're always looking for the next fellowship I found. So I applied to the Herbert Scoville Fellowship um, which um, I ended up getting, which um, took me to Washington, D.C., um, where I worked for the Truman National Security Project Educational Institute. So working on progressive national security policy in D.C. Um, and as someone who was, again, from a small town, I had no contacts in D.C. I had no way of getting my foot in the door there. Um, I wasn't connected. So applying for this, this fellowship allowed me to get a foot in the door um, and I just did, for the whole time of my fellowship, I, of course, threw myself into the work, but also into networking, which we can talk more about later. Um, and then, and then after that, I was thinking, okay, this fellowship is ending. Um, they hired me on briefly also after that fellowship, but then I thought maybe I should go to grad school. And we can discuss sort of the considerations on that. I mean, you all you all understand sort of how grad school can launch your career even further. Um, but I ended up at grad school in the UK. I went to Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland, um, where I studied international relations, but my focus was on post-conflict reconstruction and rehabilitation. 
So drilling down really into how do communities and individuals heal after conflict, um, which had been a fascination of mine um, actually since I was a child, I guess, growing up in a conflict zone. So um, that was a fascinating sort of living laboratory, um, grad school. Um, and in, in all of that, um, sort of trying to figure out what is my role here? What do I want to do? Um, I, after grad school, I sort of bounced around to a few things, but always had this sort of nugget of an idea of um, one way that we can build peace is through food, right? It's through connecting folks um, around the table. So um, there, I, I ended up starting this program called Peace Meals, um, which brings folks together to work through things like grief and trauma um, and in the wake of conflict um, through uh, nutrition education, through cooking and through communing around a table. Um, and so I, I did that program for a little bit. I was fortunate to do it in um, Northern Ireland, in Iraq, and in the US. Um, and, um, but that was a phase of my, my career and an interesting project. And then um, my partner ended up getting a job in the DC area. So we moved back to DC and I sort of was thinking, what's the next thing for me? Um, and to make a long story short, um, I heard about a job at the Peace and Security Funders Group, PSFG, where I now work. Um, which is an affinity group, it's called, of foundations and philanthropists, so donors, who support a range of peace and security issues. So things from nuclear security, nuclear nonproliferation, to supporting local peace builders, to supporting um, women peace builders, um, to addressing climate change as a driver of conflict, to cybersecurity. So peace and security encompasses this huge range of, of topics, many of which I had no idea about. I was not a nuclear expert. I was not a cybersecurity expert. And I, I'm not, I'm still not, but being able to work at an organization that touches all of these fields has been a huge learning experience for me. And it's one of the things that I love most about my job is that it's always changing and that it is so broad. Um, and so I can talk more about like the specifics of how I got the job I have now and sort of like how you make career transitions um, and how you sort of get your foot in the door in DC, if that's what you're interested in. Um, but I would say that um, working in philanthropy is not something that was ever on my radar. I thought only like rich people worked in philanthropy or like, it's this like way off in the clouds, like very elite field. Um, but now that I work here, um, I see that it's like regular people who, who want to make a difference in the world. Um, and my organization, I, I would say, is unique in that there are practitioners on the ground who are doing good work. Say they're negotiating conflicts or they're doing track two negotiations in uh, Pakistan, for example, or Afghanistan. And then there's the, the donors who fund them. And then my organization is one step above and we coordinate the donors to work together. Um, so it's a few steps removed from what I had been doing previously, working directly with folks on the ground. Um, but it is such an interesting view of the field. Um, and it also has allowed me over these past few years to help, help donors interrogate things like power and privilege and philanthropy and um, how white supremacy is a part of our field and how might we disrupt inequity, systems of inequity that um, maintain the need for charity, quote unquote, and how do you create true partnerships between funders and grantees? So those are all questions we're wrestling with now and is a big part of my job. Um, so I will stop there. I could go on and on about lots of different details here. But I hope this can be a real dialogue between us. I'm happy to answer questions about anything, really. Um, and, and we'll probably have questions for you as well, too. Thanks, Kath. While folks are putting their questions, let's say, first in the chat to make it a little more manageable with a group this size, could you unpack a little bit more how philanthropy makes a difference in questions of peace and security? A lot of our folks may be studying the security and the peace elements like you did, but but how does philanthropy come in? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is not something that I thought about when I um, 
was in school or in my early career, um, you know, you, you see the good work that is being done on the ground. For example, um, folks at a think tank who are working on what are the best approaches to nuclear disarmament or folks who are um, mediating conflict in, in uh, local communities or um, folks who are doing DDR or reintegration of ex-combatants, those sorts of like very practical work. The question is who pays their bills? Like how do they get funded to do the work? Oftentimes, um, especially um, in, in local communities, it's folks who are doing this because it's their daily life um, and volunteer, so to speak, but it, it then subsumes any paying job they have because it's so important to them. So um, the, the work and the role of philanthropy is to find those folks and to partner with them in authentic ways and to be able to support, um, to be able to support their work financially, but with other research sources also like help with advocacy, um, help with communications, um, protection is a huge thing. Funders can help by protecting local activists, um, both on the physical front, but also in the cyber realm. Um, and and so that's so funders play this this role to be a support. In an ideal world, they would like be the supportive background um, donor who just helps props up and allows the the activists and the and the practitioners to do their work. Um, the biggest donor to peace and security around the world, however, is the U.S. government. So they, and also other governments, um, but the U.S. is, is top. Um, but for example, the EU and other governments each have their own pots of funding um, towards this work. So they, that is a whole other realm of, of how peace building is supported. Um, and you're playing with a lot more money if you work for a government, um, but you're a lot less nimble. So there's a lot more reporting requirements. There's a lot more bureaucracy and red tape. And depending on where you work and which office you work in, um, the work could be a lot more slow. So that's why philanthropy is exciting um, because it's, it's smaller pots of money, of course, but you can, um, you can be a lot more creative. You can take a lot more risks than you could working for a government. Um, and uh, depending on which organization you work for, you may only, um, there, you have fewer people to answer to, I guess. You, you really are ultimately responsible to your grantees. So um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. And Jason, I see your question in the chat. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask it or would you prefer I do? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, so, Ms. Thompson, I'm a mid-career professional. I uh, spent my time in intelligence and emergency management. I'm sure there's others here who might be similar to myself. So I'm finishing out a master's. I've got 15 years experience. I'm too skilled to be an intern uh, or an entry-level job for so many people. But mid-range, they want you to have five years of sector-specific tier one humanitarian organization experience like i work with team rubicon i had okay yeah the chief like disaster officer coo of one of the largest humanitarian organizations in the world tell me like three years ago hey you need to have more credit uh, more experience with a credible organization and i'm like i'm pretty sure this organization is kind <laughs> of changing what you know the, yeah. the way people look at business and mm. they, so yeah, I'm just curious as to your mm -hmm. thoughts. Mm -hmm. I think I think you have incredible experience that's incredibly desirable um, for you know certain fields and like once you get and it depends on like do you want to go back into government or do you want to pivot to private sector or to nonprofit um, and like getting your foot wet in in any one of those sectors. Um, but I think that. First of all, you pro you probably, if you wanted to go back into government work, you could start off on a, a kind of a higher rung based on your experience. Um, but if you wanted to go into, say, nonprofit, Team Rubicon, for example, like you, you have these translatable skills um, and you've worked in some incredibly tough situations, which I think is so, it's so important to be able to message that, right? That you have, you know, you've faced enormous challenges. You haven't just been necessarily sitting in an office, 
like the rest of us and that you, you know, you're able to be resilient and pivot. And these sorts of things are important skills for work, which I think you should sell. Um, and I hear you, it always really annoys me when folks are like, this is an entry level job and you need 10 years of experience. It's like those people should be called out for those job descriptions because like, how are you gonna get experience without getting experience? And so, um, yeah. And also like the great, the grand injustice, especially in DC is the unpaid internship, um, which is all too common. Um, so uh, I think it's, it's changing. I mean, that's changing somewhat because it's worth seeing that that's an incredibly inequitable practice. Um, but philanthropy, for example, is, an or, is, is a sector that can afford to pay its people, um, so often has paid, paid internships. So um, that's a, a different sector you could look at, depending on what you're interested in doing. Jason, I also appreciate that you're in the living room of the Golden Girls. Well done. <laughs> Um, thank you, thank you. Cap, actually, that, that does lead to my next question, which it seems like a lot of philanthropic jobs are chicken and egg. You have to have experience mm -hmm. to get the experience and, and so on and so forth. Do you have thoughts about how folks either break in to, to mm -hmm. begin that cycle or translate what they've done in other places into mm -hmm. terms that, that philanthropic organizations would, would recognize and understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what I would say first is that People, and like no offense to if this is true of anyone on the call, um, but like I think it is, it's, it's so important for folks who work in philanthropy to have had experience outside of philanthropy. So you can know what it's like to have to apply to a grant and to have to depend on funding um, to meet salaries, for example. Um, so like a lifetime career in philanthropy may not serve you as well as someone who, who has, you know, experiences on, on the issues in which they're working and then moves into philanthropy or goes into philanthropy right away, then moves out and comes back in. So I would, I would give that as advice for anyone who's looking at the field of philanthropy. Um, and I think that, you know, there are places to look for jobs in philanthropy. And especially if you're first starting out, if you're looking for more of um, a junior level role, or this is your first time in philanthropy, it's much easier um, to, to find positions. And there are job boards, for example, um, at the Human Rights Funders Network, HRFN. Um, there are other funder affinity groups that work um, with uh, foundations and philanthropists, and they have job boards. So HRFN, Change Philanthropy, is another one that has a job board. Um, and the 80,000 hours project you may have heard about. Um, and they, they're they more focused on peace and security, but um, occasionally have philanthropic jobs there too. Um, so I would say like skip, skip indeed.com if you're looking for philanthropy um, and go straight to what are called PSOs, philanthropy serving organizations. Um, and actually the United Philanthropy Forum is, um, is the affinity group of affinity groups. Um, so it's like the big mothership um, under which my organization and other PSOs exist un and under us are the, are the foundations, which are our members. So if you do like a more targeted search online um, towards that, it's a, it's a better way to sort of bypass the noise and, and see work in philanthropy. Now, what I would say is you do not have to work to have had worked in philanthropy to get a job in philanthropy, especially at entry level or junior level roles. Um, people think like, oh, I've never worked in philanthropy. I'd never get this job, but that's not, not true. Um, if you have, especially at more junior level roles, if you have experience on the topic, if you're an issue expert, um, you're, you're at an advantage, um, there. So I can, um, after this call, I can dig up some of the, um, job boards too, and send them along to you, Carmen, if that's helpful. Thank you. That would be great. And, and thanks to folks putting them in the chat too. Um, we have a similar question from Annalise. Annalise, would you like to unmute yourself and ask it, or I can? I can, thank you. 
Uh, thank you for being here with us today. You've kind of gone over some of this, but just um, I am in the middle of grad school, came right out of college. So I'm wondering the best way to get your foot in the door in the peace sector in DC. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had some problems within, you know, as you were talking about the cycle of they want you to have experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it, it, like once you once you have your foot in the door, DC is a place where the peace world is actually quite small. <laughs> so you you have hustle and network, and then that can lead to other things. But the, the real question is like, how, yeah, how do you get there at first? Um, I would recommend the Scoville Peace Fellowship um, looking into that. Um, either applying there, if it's something that interests you, or look at the organizations that are on their board because they have like a 25 or 30 member board um, and they those are key organizations in DC that work on peace, ranging from nuclear security to local peace building to advocacy and policy work. Um, so it's a real gamut of things, um, but keeping your eyes on jobs um, through those organizations, I feel like Scoville is really a hub for it. Of course, I'm biased a little bit, but, um, but also, um, one thing I've found, depending on what your um, what your interest is, um, so this may not apply to everyone, but depending on what your interest is, is um, volunteering for organizations. And like we all hate that because like who has time to volunteer for free? <laughs> not not a lot of us. But one, it can actually be very fulfilling, and two, it gets your face in front of people and your name in front of people, and it gets you to know who the main people are in this space. So like if there is potential for doing like um, advocacy or um, activism or um, events around DC, volunteering um, for those things. Um, you know, it's far easier when you can do them in person, but things still happen online and virtually these days. So um, especially if you're not based in DC, you can um, sign up to support and volunteer for these organizations um, that are doing events on peace and, and security around DC. So it's kind of a cheesy recommendation, but it's actually true. <laughs> and I've seen it work for people that, you know, they had some paid job doing something, you know, waiting tables and then volunteered in a meaningful way for an organization. And then eventually were asked to potentially, um, you know, consider applying for an opening. Thanks, Kath. My question is um, what you're hearing from your members and your partners about where this space is moving. Are there particular trends that you anticipate that students should look out for if they want to position themselves or areas where you see peace and security intersecting in new mm -hmm. ways? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I, there's a couple things I would say first is like, um, an argument I've had to make to the members of my organization, some of them get this more than others, is that if you use a computer, you should care about cybersecurity. Um, because cybersecurity matters for financial transactions, for dispersing grants, it matters um, for if you're supporting local activists, I mean, who um, have their cell phones traced um, by nefarious actors and then are assaulted at their homes. Like that's an issue of many things, but it's also an issue of cybersecurity. And if you're funding those activists, you should be caring about that. So I think to the extent to which you can become very cyber literate, um, and this is coming from someone who is not, <laughs> who is like basically a Luddite, I've had to learn it on the job of like, what does this mean? How do we protect ourselves? How do we protect others? How do we protect our organizations? Um, and what are the trends coming up? I think you'll be on the cutting edge. Um, a couple of years ago, it was like AI everything. Like, how do we use AI to solve world hunger? And like, that is actually happening. So like, there, there are these like techie, trendy things, but I think the extent to which you like can speak that language, it's helpful. Um, but also I think um, there has been uh, there have been sort of two awakenings, I think, over the past few years in philanthropy, in, in, from where I sit in philanthropy. One is that we in the U.S. and in the West, Western Europe too, have a lot to learn from actors outside of the U.S. who have dealt with things like authoritarianism, the closing of civic space, 
um, like the squeezing of the press, things like that. Um, and so the bridging this like domestic international divide is important. Um, and if you can get experience doing that either through research or through doing exchanges yourself, I think that that's a it's a skill to be able to say I'm um, I'm fluent in 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 sort of cultural competency and and being able to to move from sort of a local view on things to an, an international view on things. Um, and then finally, I'd say that um, the we can't we can no longer continue to do our work um, without a consideration towards equity. And how are we working? What is the future that we're trying to build? Are our organizations truly inclusive? Am I being inclusive in my practices and in, in the way that I live my life? And, um, in sort of the information I get, like where am I getting it from? Is it all from one source? Or am I like seeking out other sources of information and diverse voice, voices that I would never have sought out before? So that, I think that's a, it's not just a moral imperative, but it's a way that we need to be living our lives. So, yeah. That's great advice, thank you. Zanny Culkin, uh, would you like to pose your question or would you like me to? Yeah, I can ask, I'll turn my video on too. Um, thank you for hosting this. This is, this is really great information so far. I, so I just got back from deployment in Syria, working with, uh, Sajidif and special forces. And I've been, my, most of my background is working overseas in Africa and in, in all over Asia and refugee camps and, and orphanages. And I'm sort of teetering with this. And now I'm in, in the grad program for international studies, but I'm, I'm really stuck at con in between conflict resolution and, and international security. And I'm just curious what advice or resources you would give to kind of figure that, figure that out. Mm -hmm. I guess the question to ask yourself would be like, at what level do I want to work? Like, do you want to work at the level of community mediation um, and conflict resolution? Um, or do you want to work at the level of sort of like civ mill operations, things like that, um, more that would like push you more into a government job, uh, most likely. And that's a question only you can answer. Maybe you've done one and you want to explore the other one more so you can have a well-rounded resume, or maybe you found, I get really tired with the bureaucracy and the red tape of the governments. Like I want to do, uh, more conflict resolution work. Um, mediation work and, and peace building work. Um, one is not better than the other. They just have their own challenges. So um, maybe in your heart, you already know what you love, but maybe you're like, I, I need to do the other thing. Um, but I would say that you don't, you're not trapping yourself into one thing. Um, I guess like I've done both in my life, worked at different levels. And so you're not, it doesn't like determine your future for all of time. Um, did you did you find that you needed experience in one or the other to to pursue one or the other or? Um, uh, I think it was more. To be honest with you, and this is only my experience. I think my experience working on more local level on conflict resolution work gave me the skills I needed to work at the higher level work. Um, so because at the end of the day, all conflict is between humans. Um, and if you can't, you know, help even two colleagues speak to each other, sort of mediate there, or if you can't like figure out how to balance a budget for a small organization, like how are you gonna do it for a larger organization? That was my personal experience. Other folks on this call might find dif differently. Um, but I think like how to facilitate conversations has been a crucial part of my work. And that only happened on sort of the, the more local level. I don't know if Thank that you. helps. But. No, I did. Thank you. Thanks, Kath. Carolyn Henri, uh, would you like to ask your question, please? Um, hi. Yeah, thanks a lot for having this. This is really great. Um, I, I had a couple of questions. Um, one was about um, impartiality in your work and in the work of your um, member organizations and how important is that 
Um, and how do you maintain that through your funding strategies? Mm -hmm. This is a really challenging question um, because f funders, you know, we want to be on the right side of history. So we want to be funding the, the good guys, quote unquote, but um, oftentimes in complex situations, that's really complex. It's not so clear who are the good guys and who are the bad guys and who committed what and et cetera, et cetera. So um, impartiality on the role in the part of donors is um, important, but I think at the end of the day, it's like your best analysis. You go with your best analysis. You do all your due diligence um, and you have to decide the clear lanes of what your funding strategy is. So what you will and will not fund. So if you're a funder, if any of you end up working for foundations in the future, you will find that friends come out of the woodwork suddenly soliciting funding, asking for money or, you know, wanting to tell you about this cool project they're working on and all well intentioned, because if you've been on the other side, if you've had to solicit funding, if you had to ask for money, then you do whatever you can. Um, but I think you need to come up with clear lanes of like what you can and cannot fund and you just have to be strong with your nose. Um, but I think impartiality um, is you try your best, but also there's an understanding that the folks you fund are the folks you, who you think are on the right side of history. Um, so um, what one approach to take is to fund with a movement lens or like sort of fund through movements. So you're not funding like one specific leader or like one um, strong personality or one strong organization, but instead you're like funding an entire ecosystem um, or working in partnership with other funders to fund an ecosystem so that um, you're like propping up all the parts of it at the same time instead of playing favorites. Um, but that, Carolyn, that's a really tough question that funders struggle with all the time. Sounds like an, an important skill if people wanted to work in this space would be a tolerance for ambiguity. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you also talked about some of the questions that folks need to ask themselves regarding their their desire to contribute directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. And Elio Azar has a question that that sort of relates to that level piece that you've touched on a little bit. Elio. Hi. I think actually my question is a bit similar to Zani's. Um, so mine was about, so I'm, I'm a fresh graduate. I'm currently a junior project manager for a um, conflict resolution project in Burkina Faso. And so my question was like, I've seen colleagues, so like I'm fresh here, but I've seen colleagues who've been in peace building on the field for years, um, sometimes longer than they wanted to. And just because HQ seems really elusive to them because <laughs> the kinds of positions that people want to take them for at, at HQ level is tends to be more like project development, uh, monitoring, which is not exactly the same human feel as what um, people like to do on the field. What they want mm -hmm. to be more engaged in is like policy and like, uh, so I'm personally really interested in disarmament and all of the big mm -hmm. peace and security questions internationally. And I'm just wondering for myself and maybe for some of my colleagues, like, how do you actually make that transition mm -hmm. from like field to still doing something that you're passionate about and interested in at more like at more HQ level? Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you have any insights on that. And thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I think you are at a huge advantage having done field work um, and having understood the stressors, <laughs> the challenges that come with that. And if you ever do move to HQ, you would be a more empathetic worker there um, because it, there can seem like such a strong divide. Um, and, and you are an asset to headquarters in the way that you can present to donors potentially about what the, the work that's being done. Um, but the way that you make that transition really depends on, it all depends again on like what you're passionate about and what you wanna do. But I also would say that um, the arc of your career is long. Um, so if you do um, a stint in the field and then you want to sort of 
move, make a sort of a lateral move or move up, um, doing m and &E is a huge asset to your resume. I mean, there are like m and &E specialists who are making big bucks because, because the US government requires strong m and &E from their grants. So if you're working in the field, you have to be monitoring and you have to be able to speak about the impact you're making, which as you know, in the peace building field is so difficult because the work is long, it's messy. Can you claim attribution? Like, did we cause there to be no conflict here? Like, it, how do you message about that? So um, moving into, a, or comms, like moving into m &E or comms or even finance or things like this will serve you in your life. And then you can make these jumps. Oftentimes folks find it easier to move from the field at one organization up at a different organization versus moving, ver rising up the ranks within their own organization. So you see that a lot. People who are, you know, they were together in Burkina Faso, both doing wash stuff. And now we're both at two different organizations. Now we're both working for the same organization in DC. And then they meet each other again in Afghanistan doing something totally different. Like that's how peace building work goes. Um, but I would say it's never, it's always a good thing to have that range of experience on your resume. Um, and the more that you do, the more you find out what you don't want to do, <laughs> which, which is helpful. Thanks. Kath, we have a few more questions that including some that folks have sent directly to me. So if you're not comfortable posting it publicly, please feel free to direct message me as well. Um, still folks trying to anticipate where the space is moving so that they can mm -hmm. tee themselves up as, as so many of our colleagues have done so well already. Um, I heard you talk about your work in research and, and building an expertise in different issues. I heard you talk about just field work and being on the ground, language skills, mm -hmm. networking, fundraising, interpersonal communication. Are there other broad skills that you think people need to be successful, either in, in peace, security, or philanthropy, or all three? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I have, uh, I'll in, after that, I'll invite Gregory Lagana to ask his particular question about, about um, members funding. Yeah, so I'd, I'd say like the, the big skills um, are, um, well, facilitation. So like, um, how especially as the world moves virtually like how do you create experiences that bring folks together um in a way that they can truly honestly talk with each other and move projects forward and i'm not talking about like mediating a conflict between two warring parties i'm talking about like how do you how do you exist in the world of colleagues um in a way that like builds everyone up and causes the most efficient and effective and um um, I don't know, collaborative ways of working. So like group facilitation um, is an underrated skill. I think, um, yeah, m and &E certainly in the, the ability to like speak the language of m and &E and to understand how to talk about impact when it comes to peace building or security um, is something I've had to learn um, for all the reasons that I was just saying, because it's such a messy field it, the timelines are so long, um, but we also want to know, like, are we having any impact and are we doing it right? Like, are we um, actually listening to the folks who, who are doing this work and who have the most to lose um, if it's done wrong? So like whose voices are included, who, whose are not included, that's important. Um, and the, sort of the ability to sell your work is, is, is important. Um, and networking, I think that's like not, it, it seems icky. It seems like transactional and like in DC, like everybody's schmoozing and like passing around their business cards and things like that. But I think there's a way to do, to build your network in a heartfelt way. And one, the, the advice that I was given when I first moved to DC was like, don't, don't see people as just what you can get from them. Well, first of all, be kind to your interns because they may someday be your boss just too real or be kind to your interns because they may someday work for your donor which is also something i've experienced so be kind to everyone just because you should um but recognize that like um everyone's life is valuable and you don't need to be like gaining from them instead what can you give to the to the contacts that you're making 
Um, so I would literally keep a folder of like interesting articles or interesting podcasts or events coming up. And um, if there were people who I thought were really cool and who I wanted to stay in contact with, I would on occasion, not spam them, but on occasion send an email of like, I just listened to this podcast. You would love it. Hope you're doing well. And then eventually when it came for me, when I was looking for a new job, I was, I reached out to those folks who I was still in contact with and said, Hey, I'm looking, just wanted to put that on your radar. Let me know if you hear of anything. And indeed that's how I found my current job. So I think, but it's not that I like wanted something or like always needed something or only contacted them if I wanted a letter of reference. It's like, I wanted to nurture the relationship with those people because they were cool people and I still still am in contact with them. So um, that's just my advice about networking. Um, but in terms of other skills, I think like if you can ever get experience in grant writing or fundraising, you're invaluable. <laughs> I think if I ever ran my own nonprofit, the person who would be paid most on staff would be the fundraiser. Um, so if you can say, I, I wrote a grant for a million dollars and it was successfully submitted, like ding, ding, like that is a great thing on your resume too. Or it doesn't have to be a million dollars. It could be like, I helped a local organization apply for a grant from USAID for $1,000 and they got it. And I think that is um, equally important. And all of your schools have fundraising teams that I'm sure would welcome. Yeah, the time volunteers. and effort that you if you if you can't find anywhere else to do it, I'm sure mm -hmm. there's a team on campus. Mm -hmm. um, Gregory, would you has a question about the Peace and Security Index report? So, Gregory, yeah. I invite you to uh, speaking of uh, seeking funding. <laughs> uh, full disclosure: I'm I'm actually a research administrator here at Pitt, and the invite came to Pitt and one of our research centers who specializes in topics such as countering violent extremism and prevention of radicalization asked me to attend. So I'll, I'll ask a very brief question then I'll get out of the way of the students here. Um, the, your organization's Peace and Security Index Report is really fabulous in that it immediately let me know who the major players in this space were. Mm -hmm. And even better, you give people the capability to drill down by topic area. So I was able to easily do so on the issue of extremism and mm -hmm. see exactly who, who was uh, funding programmatic and research activity in those areas. Uh, for, for, the, for the students that find themselves in a position where they might be helping with grants or might be seeking funding for their organization, that's a great tool. But on the other hand, the, the data is a bit old, a year or two mm -hmm. old. Mm -hmm. Does your organization do any outlook surveys of its members to see what's coming down the pipe? Uh, sort of a future short range look in addition to that very careful documentation of what they have been funding in the past? That's a great question. And there's a reason why it's outdated is because most of, so fund foundations. Um, so Carmen just put in the chat that our um, peace and security funding index. Um, but actually, if you go to, um, we just start, we launched a corollary map. Um, about a year and a half ago. So I'll put that in the chat here too. Um, and the map, I don't know if you saw that Gregory, but um, it is um, the same information, but in real time. So the way that foundations, it's like a super weird and long URL there, but um, the way that foundations um, report their grant making, in the US at least, they're required to report their grant making on their 990 tax forms every year. But those are always a few years behind. They always lag a few years behind. Um, so it's impossible to get the information from everyone at the same time. So the most complete, complete year that we have would be about two years behind of seeing like what were funders funding about two years ago. But it's still interesting to see the trend analysis and who, who are the major players in each space. Um, now our funding map that I put in the, um, in the chat here, it's, it's real time. So it's actually updated every single day as grants come in either to Candid, the organization that administers this map or on 990 tax forms. So it's a bit more up to date, um, but still, um, organizations, you know, it, they may lag in their reporting. So it's a challenge to get real-time information or future-looking information. But I would say that whatever 
whatever the whatever's coming down the pike in the world of um, peace and security generally, funders are thinking of it. They're thinking, should should we be in this space? Like, should we change our strategy? Is there ways that we can open up new monies for things? Um, like in the CVE space that your colleagues work on, um, you know, after 9-11, that meant one thing. And like, now I think there's more, more interest about uh, sort of um, domestic terrorism, white nationalism, that sort of thing here in the US at least. Um, and, and that is, you know, that's still a threat and that has been a threat since the founding of our nation. And so how do we, um, how do we address that? What is the space for civil society to address that? Um, and the interesting thing about the, this foundation center map um, is that you can click on the button that shows US government grants as well. Um, so to some extent, you can see which US government agencies are working um, on these issues and um, what kind of money is there. It's, it's an incomplete picture because it's hard to get you know, reporting and understanding that from the government, but I hope that resource helps. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kath. Um, we've been sharing some of the tools that PSFG has, and we have a couple of questions for folks looking to know more about PSFG members or, or philanthropic organizations in specific issue areas. So I'm going to put the member list in the chat, but we also had a question from Parvez, I believe, sorry, got away from me, uh, about a specific field. So I invite Parvez to unmute himself. still here. Sorry. There we go. We can hear you. Right here. Um, um, so thank you. Um, your presentation has been really informative. Um, so my story is really uh, unique, but I think you've, and everybody's is, but I think you've answered some of the questions. So I was in the museum field, but I had a, dis, um, a degree in um, international development. And I got that like 10 years ago, but I never worked in the field. But in 2016, I happened to get a job as a driver in a local refugee um, resettlement organization in Nashville, which I moved because I was kind of sick of New York City and decided to move to Nashville because my wife had got a job there. So in three months, I made director of development and uh, I've been there now in this position for five years. Um, and um, I'm now interested to take the next leap. So I speak several languages, have lived all over the world. I've raised over a million dollars, learned this new skill. So I got a lot of information here uh, from what, you, what you've said. But I think what works against me is trying to convince people that those five years or six years of experience that I now have is gonna be valid to stay in the same position I'm in now, in C-suite position in one of these organizations. Cause I do not wanna start any lower than that. Mm -hmm. What's your advice for someone like me who, whose experience might be a little different? And by the way, I'm also getting an EMPA right now. So mm -hmm. that's how I got this invitation. So I'm going mm -hmm. on my third master's. I speak five languages, et cetera. Mm -hmm. so, well, it sounds like you're a, you're a major asset to the field and you would be an asset coming to DC at any of these organizations. Um, I think that um, now more than ever, at least hearing from my, my friends who work within the refugee space, um, so much funding was cut um, yeah. in the past couple of years. Uh, there was a real crisis. So, and like people need fundraisers. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I bet you could throw your hat in the ring for any number of development jobs here in DC um, and be competitive for that. Um, the... The problem is that when you work at smaller organizations, you may have more seniority. You're a big fish in a small pond, right? And then if you move to one of these, like IRC or um, one, of, one of those big ones, like you may feel like a small fish in a huge pond um, or like search for common ground. Like these are huge international organizations. So it might feel like you're taking a step down or something, but your amount of responsibility might be equivalent. Um, might feel equivalent or um, it might feel the same. It might feel like a really natural move, a natural fit. So I, I would say like, don't be afraid of like feeling like you're entering a more junior position or something like that. Um, but definitely speak to your, um, to the amount of responsibility you have had and what you have done in the position and that, so they can see like, hey, you, you would be a benefit 
to this organization. Um, but I think it is, I think that's the problem um, when I hear of friends who want to move, especially from like coastal cities to DC, they're like all the, pro all the, it seems like the same position, but it's, but it's like way more junior. Um, but it, it, I think it's just like this weird, like hierarchy thing in DC. And like, you may find yourself with the same salary one and with the same amount of responsibility, but the title might be different. So maybe there's room for negotiation there. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. I hope it helps. And ma'am, I would just say that the level of interaction is generally higher and more beneficial too. Instead of, you know, talking to the local city council, you may be called to the senator's office or the White House versus, I mean, and the exposure is even more impactful as well. Mm -hmm. Kath, we also had a question wondering what philanthropic organizations or broad organizations you see working on climate change and gender equity. We've talked a little bit about equity here, but folks you think mm -hmm. are doing good work? Yeah, there's two really interesting organizations, um, Urgent Action Fund for Women's Human Rights um, and Global Fund for Women um, and MADRE, another organization, MADRE. Um, they all have programs that sort of like cut across those. They're like, they're very interesting um, funders who fund hyper-locally. Um, so, and they see, I think actually like um, Grassroots International and Urgent Action Fund um, had sort of a, um, and Global Green Grants Fund maybe had sort of a pooled fund to support women climate activists um, and environmental defenders. That's great. Thank you. And for as many wonderful organizations as you've cited, it seems as though, so my first question is, it seems like positions do not come open very often in this space, either because people stay for a long time or just the funders themselves don't have many staff. Is that your impression? And if so, are there other parts of the ecosystem that still contribute to this space but aren't necessarily working directly for a funder? Hmm. Um, you're not wrong. It, it is like, it's a small world. Like even in the, not, like the, fun, the peace and security funding world is very small. The peace and security world is still very small. <laughs> and like, you get, like the same people do many of the same things in DC. Um, but I think like getting experience in philanthropy generally would set you up better for a role in peace and security philanthropy, um, or working directly for, you know, doing some sort of peace and security work on the ground, doing more direct work or think tank work, um, would set you up also for, a, for a nice pivot, um, into philanthropy as, and as long as you keep your eyes open for, for the jobs. Um, but um, I think that, you know, there are all sorts of, how do I put this? Like, there are all sorts of jobs you could do that will set you up for a role in philanthropy. Um, but I think like maintaining your connection to peace building or, or to security, um, national or international, um, will allow you to always keep one foot in the field and to sort of tell, be able to tell the story of the arc of your career. Um, so I've done like really random things in my life. Like I went to culinary school <laughs> to like run, to learn how to run piecemeals, which kept me in the peace building field, um, which then like led into the rest of my career. But I don't think you have to only work at a foundation and stay in a foundation forever. Don't let that scare you. That's, that's reassuring. Thank you. <laughs> um, and now we're going to have to have you cook for all of us when human contact is allowed again. Right. We have about five more minutes. So if other folks have questions, please feel free to, to throw them in the chat. Uh, one of the questions I get often because APSIA has a worldwide audience is how often groups and foundations and organizations based in one country hire nationals, international mm -hmm. students or whatever from another place. Do you see a lot of hiring of international students or, or grads in, in your sector? Um, I think, yes, um, with a caveat, yes, because there are, you know, language, um, like ben the benefits of foreign languages, there are benefits of like cultural understanding that we don't have um, necessarily in-house. Um, I think that, however, the pandemic has like caused a lot of challenges with 
with that, with international hiring, with hiring in general, but especially international hiring. Um, there is, however, you know, more and more foundations are seeing how there needs to be local agency and local ownership um, on the programs they fund. So like, why are we funding only Americans or how, why are we hiring only Americans to administer programs in Uganda? We need to be hiring Ugandans for this. So I think that um, that is a, is a paradigm shift that's happening more and more. So if you are not based in the US or Western Europe necessarily, like still apply for those jobs, still do it. And if you are the best candidate for it, unless they've explicitly said like, we can't support a visa or something like that. If you're the best candidate for it, um, you're the best candidate. So don't let that stop you. Um, and, you know, be bold, I guess, in what you apply for. Cause you just never know, you really never know. Thank you so much. My last two questions. One, any other advice that you think people should know so they can grow up to be like you? That's question one. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah, nurture your most important asset, your most important skill, the most important thing of your entire career path is other humans. It's human relationships and it's nurturing those relationships and maintaining them. Um, and like you can build up all the awesome CV that you have, but um, if it's, you know, not, you know, you want to be someone who's good to work with and you like maintaining the contacts across your career is essential. My last one before we, we send you off to the rest of your day is if folks want to learn more or stay in touch with PSFG, where should they go? Um, well, you can go to our website to see, check out the index. You can check out the, the foundation map and things like that. Um, and uh, Carmen, you can feel free to share my email. All right, I'll just put it in, in the chat. Um, so folks can connect with me. I am like trying my best to stay on top of email. <laughs> but yeah, folks, yeah, feel free to, to connect with me and ask questions. I'm happy to help if I can. The only thing I can help with is fundraising advice. <laughs> I can never connect you with funders or that sort of thing, but happy to talk about careers. Well, thank you so much, Kath. This has been fantastic. And thank you also for being open to taking emails from all of our students, um, especially at this weird time. Did I lose all of you? Fear I might have. Maybe, can you stay, can you all still hear me? Oh, I'm back. <laughs> Sorry, Hello. I froze. Sorry oh, the that. joys of technology <laughs> yes. at the finish line. Um, yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Kath, for all of your great wisdom and, and insight and advice. Thanks to all of you students for being here with us and my colleagues uh, at the different career offices. We really look forward to welcome you to future APSIA webinars. And I'll be able to share this recording through the APSIA YouTube page down the line. So have a great rest of your day wherever in the world you find yourself. And thanks for all the good work that you do. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Yep, thank you.